we are going to get today a behind the scene tour of the Brown Palace. I'm so excited for this. I've always wanted to do this. Going into the Brown Palace. You yeah. excited, honey? Yeah. All right. You love it? Yeah, it's so cute. Today, we're not only bringing you to where the public can see, we're bringing you on a behind the scenes tour that nobody has ever seen. It's great, huh? You love it? Yeah, it's really cute. Before we uncover the secrets of the Brown Palace, just take a look at the beauty and the history that is present to anyone who walks through the doors of the Brown Palace. What do you think of the Brown Palace? It's beautiful. What are your favorite parts so far? Stained glass ceiling. All right, before we get going too far into this, I have to mention that Haley and I own a real estate brokerage in the area and Haley's also a lender. So if you're thinking about buying, selling, or investing in Colorado, please keep us in mind. We would love to help. Before we get going into every secret corner of the Brown Palace, I think it's important to understand its historical significance for the city of Denver. In 1880, the vision was born for the Brown Palace by Henry C. Brown, who is a prominent real estate developer in Denver, and he donated 10 acres of land to the state where the Colorado State Capitol was eventually built. This part is really important because in Colorado, there was a bunch of different cities like Golden, Pueblo, and many others that were fighting to be the territorial capital of Colorado and eventually the state capital of Colorado. Brown had an ingenious idea to attract this to the growing city of Denver. And that was, hey, why don't I just donate 10 acres of land on what was known as Brown's Bluff and what is now known in Denver as Capitol Hill. Now, Brown may have donated that 10 acres, but when it grew in value, he tried to get it back from the state of Colorado and actually lost a couple of Supreme Court cases. But this ended up being a wonderful thing for the Brown Palace, where he was going to build one of Denver's most luxurious hotels and what ended up to be the most luxurious hotel west of the Mississippi. You can see that detail in the Brown Palace today, even. So, Brown in 1889 was a classic entrepreneur. He had several failed business ventures. He almost went into bankruptcy. He was forced to mortgage most, most of his land, but despite his financial problems, he proceeded with plans to build the Grand Hotel and determined to create a structure that would reflect Denver's ambitions. Some of this was because he was sour that he didn't get to build his dream mansion on Capitol Hill. So he thought, yeah, why don't I just build a palace instead? In 1890, construction begins of the Brown Palace and begins under the architectural firm of Frank E. Edbrook who was one of Denver's leading architects at the time. The project had an ambitious budget, which was $1.6 million, which is equivalent to around $55 million in today's value. Still think that's a pretty good deal, but back in the time, this was a lot of money to be spending on a hotel. They also spent $400,000 furnishing the hotel, so that's another $15 million that they just put into furnishing the hotel. The level of detail, opulence, and grandeur was unmatched for the time. The Brown Palace had its own electricity, created by steam from its boiler system, tapped into the Arapaho Aquifer and had its own spring water, then had Turkish baths and was just opulence in hotel form that really put Denver on the map and has ever since been a beacon in the city of Denver. In August 12th of 1892, the grand opening happened of the Brown Palace, and they were charging, I think, between $1 to $2 a night, which is around $150, bucks, 200 bucks a night, so prices are relatively the same at the Brown Palace. 
The hotel featured ornate designs, including the Italian marble that you see at the beginning. Its exterior was created from sandstone from the Colorado region itself. There was gold leaf accents. There was elaborate iron railings. And it quickly became a meeting place for Denver's wealthy and influential citizens. And continued to be a meeting place for wealthy people up until today. So the Brown Palace really comes on the map here in the 1890s, helps really establish Denver as this booming city and is immediately a success for Henry Brown those first 10 years of the Brown Palace. Now, I'll take a pause here and note that it was Henry Brown's goal, who was a Freemason, to build this hotel perfect in the eyes of God, so to speak, but to not sneeze in the face of God, they purposefully put some faults in the Brown Palace. One of those faults can be identified by looking at the ornate railing that I was mentioning. There's a couple plaques actually that were placed upside down. I believe one's on the third floor, one's on the fifth floor. The funny thing is here, if you draw a line between the two upside down plaques, it actually meets exactly one mile above sea level. So they didn't want it to be perfect, but Henry Brown couldn't just help himself from making it perfect. You know, that's how you do it. In 1902, there is some financial troubles though for Henry Brown. In 1903, there's a great bank collapse too in the United States. He faced mounting financial pressures. His personal finances collapsed due to overextension and real estate, and Brown is forced to sell the hotel in 1902 to a consortium led by Winfield Scott Stratton, a wealthy Colorado mining magnate. It's my understanding that they just forced him to pass financing over. In 1905, C.K. Betcher also takes over this hotel and really leads it successfully through the early 20th century. He remodels the hotel in the Roaring Twenties to keep it up to date and keep it going with the times. And the Brown Palace really remains a beacon and and even survives the Great Depression. The Grand Palace during the Dwight D. Eisenhower administration was known as the White House of the West because President Dwight D. Eisenhower actually moved the entire White House to the Brown Palace, who stayed here for an extensive period of time and took over a complete floor almost of the Brown Palace to run his remote presidency. Apparently it's because good old Dwight liked some of the golfing here in Colorado and decided what a nice place to run the country from. In the 50s, the Brown Palace was designated as a historic landmark, and in the 80s, it goes under another multi-million dollar restoration and tries to restore it to its Gilded Age grandeur. The Brown Palace has hosted a lot of famous people in it. Some of those people are the unsinkable Molly Brown, who actually got to take a look at where she signed into the Brown Palace, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, the Beatles, and was the formation of the Chinese government in exile after Mao took over as well. So a lot of history has happened in these walls. With great history, generally you get some paranormal activity, and that's no different with the Brown Palace, which has a lot of celebrated ghost stories, which I was surprised to see confirmed by a lot of the employees who work there who were no strangers to the paranormal themselves. One of my favorite stories happened in the Brown Palace Club, which overlooks the old entrance of the Brown Palace, which used to be on Broadway. Apparently, Claude Betcher, who we discussed as one of the owners of the Brown Palace in the early 1900s, wife Edna, loved to sit up there and watch people come in and frequent the Brown Palace. The only thing is, 
Edna never left. Some employees told me that lights would turn on and off, they would feel shivers down their entire body. Edna was trying to say hello in more ways than one in the Brown Palace Club. Another famous poltergeist at the Brown Palace is a ticket salesman. Where the Brown Palace Spa is now was, back in the day, where train tickets were sold. Apparently, one of the workers didn't get the M.O. that this place was turned into a spa and still frequents the lobby and is seen today selling train tickets. A lot of people don't know that the ninth floor used to be residences at the Brown Palace. When the Brown Palace was originally built, the eighth floor was a two-story floor, which hosted most of the major events. The Brown Palace Club had the a meeting room, had a cigar bar, and all the fancy stuff that the elite would have wanted at that time. At some point, this was converted into the 8th and ninth floor, which were made into permanent residents. The only thing is, one resident who lived in 904 never left. Louise Hill, a popular socialite who lived in the Brown Palace between the 40s and the mid-1950s, reportedly never left the Brown Palace. When these rooms were under construction and were converted into a more mid-century modern sort of feel, apparently the hotel switchboard got a call from room 904 while there was not even any phone lines in the room. There is also a serviceman who is a waiter who uses the service elevator as in full uniform. There are ghostly children who play and laugh hallways, and oftentimes a baby is heard crying and screaming in the boiler room in the basement. The Brown Palace has its fair share of ghost stories, and I'm sure I've only scratched the surface. Take a walk with us into the subterranean world of the Brown Palace. Now keep in mind, when the Brown Palace was built in the late 19th century, service was a thing to be hidden. So, most of what happens in the Brown Palace happens down in the basement. I'm going to break the basement into a few different sections because the kitchen's in the basement, the hidden tunnel across the streets in the basement, and there's a bunch of treasure in the basement as well, metaphorically speaking. Take a look here as we go through some of the Brown Palace storage. There was just so much to be seen here, like old plates, all the laundry going on in the Brown Palace, and so much more. I'm just giving you a glimpse of it here. Super cool what's going on down here. Next, after this, we're gonna look at the kitchen. Plunging down from the Market Street side through Brown Palace receiving. Look at that view as we descend into the basement of Brown Palace once again, which is also where the kitchen is located. If you ever show up for that Brown Palace tea time, that there are some delicious things that are going on down here. Look at this, I mean, even the staff eats well at the Brown Palace with the buffet for all the staff that are working that particular day. We're gonna take a trip here through some different sections of the kitchen. Right now we're in the bakery, which is a super cool place here. This is an oven that is only in three places in the world. One of those places is the Smithsonian, one is another oven in Germany, and right here in the Brown Palace, this is the only one of those ovens that works, which the Brown Palace uses to make bread from scratch. So you literally cannot have bread like the Brown Palace anywhere else in the world. Whenever this thing breaks, they're handy people on staff just figure out how to MacGyver it and fix it because obviously they don't make parts for an oven like this anymore. There's that wheel spinning, which is making that turntable spin on the inside, so that way all that bread gets an even cook. Look at these pans that they make the bread in. So everything at the Brown Palace pretty much is done from scratch, which is why it is so delicious. You can take a look here at some of the bread 
and some of the crackers that the Brown Palace makes in-house. I apologize if you're hungry because this is probably making it even worse for you. If you weren't hungry enough, let's take a look at some of these handmade desserts and handmade chocolates that the Brown Palace makes each and every day. I couldn't resist. I had to try some of this chocolate. Some of the chocolate even has the Brown Palace logo on it. So, chocolatiers and Willy Wonka be warned, Brown Palace has given you some competition over here with their handmade desserts, which you can't have anywhere else in the world. They even import special ingredients like that double cream for their tea time. So ingredients really do matter at the Brown Palace, and you can really taste these hand-picked ingredients. The scale and veracity of the amount of people that Brown Palace feeds through its events and through its several restaurants, which we'll go through, becomes apparent as you start to take in all of the assorted china, the assorted serving trays, and everything that's present in the basement to feed the mass amount of people that come through the Brown Palace every day. I'll also point out this yellow brick wall here, original to the Brown Palace. And it's just amazing stepping into the past and really seeing how this kitchen has operated for generations and generations. Here's that silver being polished with a silver polishing machine, pretty cool. This is where you'll really get a sense of how many people dine at the Brown Palace. Look at all of these catering racks, rack upon rack upon rack. It's truly something that's really impressive and a once in a lifetime thing here to walk through the kitchen of the Brown Palace. Absolutely beautiful. Now let's walk through this door here. We'll get to see some fancy stuff at the Brown Palace. Get ready. This is where all of the expensive wine is stored. Yeah, you're seeing those prices, right? That's how much it is per bottle. I was just amazed at the amount of wine in this cellar. Soon we'll go over to the catering cellar too, which has even more in it, but this is all top shelf aged vintage wine in this cellar. Super duper cool. This room here, which is the chilled room for the whites and the champagnes. No stone unturned at the Brown Palace when it comes to service and options. Here are some of the kegs at the Brown Palace. some of the offices for the kitchen staff here, and then dry storage as well. Now we're going to leave the kitchen and go somewhere even more secretive. The boiler room is one of the most secretive rooms in the Brown Palace and also put it on the map because the Brown Palace was known to be absolutely fireproof, which is a big deal in the 19th century. However, more recently, the Brown Palace did have a boiler explode here, which did cause the Brown Palace to shut down for quite a bit of time. That's where this happened. The Brown Palace also is known for having a tunnel, which you can see this pipe going through here, which connected it to the Navarre, which was across the street here, which was known as a brothel back in the 19th and early 20th century. So many wealthy patrons were brought underneath this tunnel across the Navarre so they wouldn't be caught by their suspecting wives for involving themselves in mischief. The tunnel also was known to bring in liquor during Prohibition. 
So, this is where a lot of the secrets happen, down in the Brown Palace. I just imagine wealthy patrons of the Brown Palace going underneath this street right here, like Teddy Roosevelt and so many others. I'm not saying you did it, Teddy, but there was a lot of wealthy people that stayed here that didn't want people to know what they were doing, whether it was drinking, during Prohibition, or having a marital affair. Also, Brown Palace was known in the early days to provide electricity, which happened through steam manufacturing, through some of these boilers down here, and it was known to have some of the best plumbing in the city of Denver. So, pretty crazy look at history down here in the basement of the Brown Palace. Definitely feels like somewhere you would go when you're up to no good, which is what this room brought in and out during the 19th and 20th centuries. You could see here a fuel source even for this stuff and an old article saying how great that Brown Palace plumbing was back in the day. I'm also just amazed by the foundation of the Brown Palace here, which you can see are these giant stone blocks, a testament of time and a product of the Rocky Mountains. This is the rhyolite stone likely mined near somewhere like Castle Rock at the time. And the sheer size of these boilers, which are still providing heat for the hotel today, is truly something to behold. This is one of the neatest sections of the Brown Palace that I got to go into and geek out. And I think you can see why. This old machinery and the echoes of the past history of this room resound in the Brown Palace. Here you can see some of those steam pipes bringing steam in from a Denver steam itself, which is absolutely amazing. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Welcome up to the 10th floor of the Brown Palace. Most people don't even know that there is a 10th floor to the Brown Palace because you have to go up the service stairs or the service elevator here. We start off in the archive room of the Brown Palace, which is just steeped in history as almost everything exists up here from the Brown Palace's past. Pictures, books, and Ed Brooks architectural renderings. The originals are up here. Here we pull out the original 8th floor, which like I mentioned, was where it was happening back in the 19th and 20th centuries. This was the main floor that had the grand dining room, the Brown Palace Club, the Ladies Ordinary. All of this stuff was up on the 8th floor, which now is both the 8th and 9th floor because it had super high ceilings. Here are all the original sign-in books of the Brown Palace. Of course, before computers, people hand-signed in when they checked in to the Brown Palace. Here is Mrs. Brown, or the unsinkable Molly Brown signature. General Sun, who had the Chinese government in exile here. Both signed in to the Brown Palace. It's just really neat to take a tour through history in those books. Here's the 10th floor as well, where they use to fix stuff up that is in the Brown Palace. There's some of the original drafts of the Brown Palace back there as well, an upholstery room. Check out this old piano. Picture of Brown himself up here. We also have access to the roof. There's an endless treasure chest of items up here on the 10th floor as well. 
that were discarded from the Brown Palace at a certain time. Old light fixtures, old paintings, old furniture. Here's another view from the other side of the roof here. see on this section of the roof the brown palace has its own hives as well which makes brown palace honey which is super duper neat there is a view from above of the stained glass window which you can see in the lobby of the brown palace how this whole rooftop connects here super neat to see this triangle architecture from above as well Here we are outside of the Brown Palace Club. This facade used to sit at the original entrance of the Brown Palace and now serves as the entryway to the Brown Palace Club. The Brown Palace Club used to be a gentleman's club until the 80s. Also was the head of the Eisenhower White House when it was there and was mentioned previously in this film for being ultra haunted. Here is the Onyx Room, also known as the Room of the Creepy Cupids. Notice these awesome murals up here, but if you look really close at the cupids that are above you, you'll notice that the painter actually inserted some of his family members into the faces of the cupids, so they are children's bodies with creepy adult faces, albeit this is a beautiful room with this marble here and with the ornate chandeliers. But you do have these cupids looking down, blessing whatever meeting you put in this room here. Also, the Brown Palace has larger meeting rooms on the other side of it in the Holiday Inn. So, a lot of events are held here at the Brown Palace and have been held here for time immemorial. Let's check out the Palace Arms, which also has Churchill Bar, a cigar bar on the other side, but the Palace Arms is a treasure. Welcome inside the Palace Arms, which I would consider one part museum and one part restaurant. Here's some dueling pistols used by Napoleon. Artifacts in here are from the Napoleonic era, so the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. Apparently Napoleon himself wore that armor the detail in this room will transport you back in time. These stained glass windows here were from the Arapahoe County Courthouse when this was Arapahoe County before Denver County was established. And the Betcher family had a large influence on bringing a lot of these artifacts back. Like I said, a lot of them were from Napoleon himself, which is super duper neat. Also located within this restaurant is the Independence Room, which has a mural which is only three places in the world. The White House, the Louvre, and here. This is a hand-painted mural by a French artist that depicts the United States during the American Revolution. It's truly detailed, transportative, and beautiful. Imagine hosting a private event in this room and truly sitting within history. Here's another look at those beautiful stained glass windows, piece of Denver history. Palace Arms also has its own kitchen located away from the main kitchen, which is in the basement. So it can serve its guests in regal style. Looking at some of these banners here that Napoleon brought back from Notre Dame on his way to declare himself the Emperor of France. You can really feel the history oozing from every corner of this room. Not to mention, there's a pretty good collection of liquor here. Welcome to the Brown Palace's 
newest restaurant addition, a revived restaurant that was remodeled after a water leak in the Brown Palace, Ellington's. Ellington certainly has a modern flair about it, being bright white, airy, and filled with abundant plant life in here. Ellington serves as an exquisite brunch spot and is filled with historic pictures of the Brown Palace on the walls, as you are seeing here. Also, we've got some of the old floor plans of the Brown Palace, like this one, which is how it was set up when Eisenhower occupied it as the Western White House. Here's Ellington's menu, which is filled with delicious brunch food. So if you're in the mood for a great brunch here, the Brown Palace is a nice spot to stop. After an exhilarating day of filming the Brown Palace, I stop at the oldest restaurant in the Brown Palace, opened in the 30s, right at the end of Prohibition, because we know that Brown Palace wasn't serving any liquor during it, wink wink. The Brown Palace has the Ship Tavern, which is filled with model ships brought back by Betcher in the 1930s while he was traveling in the Caribbean. Super good restaurant though, homemade bread as you're seeing here. I got the prime rib, which was absolutely delicious. Here's a look at the menu. Thank you so much for coming on a tour with us to the Brown Palace. If you like what you're seeing here, make sure to subscribe to our channel, bringing you all sorts of Colorado history and fun.